Greetings, everyone, and welcome to the online service of Stanley Park Baptist Church. It's such a blessing to be able to come together in this way, to connect together as we sing, as we pray, as we hear the word. Scripture says we are to bless the Lord at all times. And as a church family, we have the unique opportunity to praise his name together. And so, today as we worship, let's look to Jesus once again and be reminded of how good He is to us and how gracious He is to us. Let's see Christ for who He is. He is our King of Kings. Let's exalt His name together. give life, you are love, you bring light to the darkness, you give hope, you restore every heart that is broken, and grace your breath in our lungs so we pour out our praise we pour out our praise it's your breath in our lungs so we pour out our praise to you only Give life, you are love, you bring light to the darkness, you give hope, you restore every heart that is broken. Great your breath in our lungs so we pour out our praise we pour out our praise it's your breath in our lungs so we pour out our praise to you only it's your breath in our lungs so we pour out our praise we pour it's your breath in our lungs, so we pour out our praise to you only. shout your praise our hearts will cry these bones will sing great are you Lord and all the earth will shout your praise our hearts will cry these bones will sing great Well 
will shout your praise and our hearts will cry these bowls will sing great are you lord it's your breath in our lungs so we pour out our praise we pour out our praise it's your in our lungs, so we pour out our praise to you only. It's your breath in our lungs, so we pour out our praise. We pour out our praise. It's your breath in our lungs, so we pour. step down into darkness open my eyes let me see beauty that made this heart adore you hope of a life spent with you so here I to worship here I am to bow down here I am to say that you're my God you're all together lovely all together worthy all together wonderful to
Pastor Peter with Stanley Burke. How are all of our Bible Town people doing this week? We pray you're doing well, and we hope you're getting to spend time with Jesus every day. Well, Stanley Burke, I'm so glad you're here to help me out again. Um, and since it's the last Sunday in January, you know what that means, right? Mm -hmm. What does it mean? Birthdays. You're right. We got to do some birthday shout outs. So why don't you grab your little boombox there and... I gotta let you know, Angel was helping me out with the birthdays last month, and her boombox is way bigger than yours. Okay, I'm so sorry I, I said that. I take it back. I shouldn't have even mentioned it. But here, why don't you hit the music? Thank you, and here we go. We want to wish a happy birthday to Reed. Happy birthday, Reed. And we also want to wish a happy birthday to Nolan. Happy birthday, Nolan. Next, we want to wish a happy birthday to Grace. Happy birthday, Grace. And we want to wish a happy birthday to Amelia. Happy birthday, Amelia. And finally, we want to wish a happy birthday to Nora. Happy birthday, Nora. Happy birthday to all of you. We hope all of you had amazing and fun birthdays, and we hope you were able to celebrate them with your family and friends. God bless you all. Well, thanks again so much for helping me with that, Stanley Bark. And as you know, at this point, we would usually go into our devotional. But I thought, hey, why don't we do something different today? And so, yeah, and I figured we could spend our time together praying for all of our students. Yeah, as you might know, most of our kids, both in Bible Town and in youth, have to do all of their schoolwork online, which isn't easy. Many of them have to spend hours upon hours in school by watching lessons and doing homework on their computers. Some of our kids spend upwards of six hours a day doing schoolwork online. Yeah, six hours, that's, that's a lot of time. We can only imagine how unmotivating and discouraging it must be when you're spending so much of your time in front of a screen. I'm sure all of us can see that this is not good for our kids' physical and mental well-being. That's why I think we should pray together for all of our students today, asking the Lord to sustain them and encourage them, and that the Lord would also give their parents wisdom in discerning when their kids need a really good break from all that screen time. And finally, as most of you already know, it's clear that our kids are really looking forward to going back to school and back to church in person. After all, God made us as physical, social beings, and we're meant to be interacting with one another in person, face to face. So let's make sure to pray that these lockdowns would also come to an end very soon. And so here, let's bring our hands together, let's bow our heads, and let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, we're so thankful for this time that we can spend together and we can spend with you, bringing our petitions and needs before you. Lord, we want to pray for all of our Bible Town kids and for our youth, for all of our students who are spending so much of their time online doing school during these days. Lord, we pray that you would sustain them and that you would encourage them and that you would give them the energy to keep going forward in their studies. Lord, we also want to pray for our parents. We pray that you would give them wisdom and discernment in determining when enough is enough, when it's okay to say to their children, you know what, you need a day off, you need a break from all of this screen time. And finally, Lord, we want to pray for all of these lockdowns. Lord, we look forward to the day when we can come back to church and have fellowship with one another, worshiping you 
And so, Lord, I just pray that these lockdowns would come to an end very soon and that we would be able to see one another face to face, giving you all the glory. Lord, we also pray that all of our Bible Town kids and our youth would come to know Jesus as their Lord and Savior and that they would be guided by his Holy Spirit as they walk with you day by day. Lord, we thank you for all things. We thank you for your son, Jesus, and we pray all of this in his precious name. Amen. Amen. Well, everyone, we're so glad we were able to spend this time together praying for our youth and for our for our children, especially those who are just handling so much schoolwork online right now. Uh, we hope all of you have an amazing week ahead of you, and we look forward to seeing you next Sunday. God bless you all. Bye-bye. <laughs>
Father, Son, and Spirit in the orchestration of the gospel. May we never take it for granted. May it only grow more precious in our hearts. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you that this world, with all of its troubles, all of its chaos, pain, and grief, it is not the end. Thank you that we have hope beyond hope of this world. Thank you that the trials of this life remind us that there is something more than this life. And that more is glorious. But while we are here, we do have trials. We have trials that are not pleasant. So I bring them before you and humbly ask for your grace to remove the trials from us and give us strength to endure until you do. Lord, you say in your word that your joy is our strength. Please grant us that joy upon joy that we might be more than conquerors in all of our struggles. We pray for those who have physical ailments. Please give relief, give healing, comfort, and strength. We pray for our beloved sister Lees. Pray for insight for those who need it to do what needs to be done to make her healthy again and comfort in her struggles. We pray for Ruth and her surgery that she would heal quickly, but in the meantime, enjoy the time off of her feet, being served as she has served so many others. We pray for those with chronic illness, struggles that seem to have no end, but we pray that your love and your joy in overflowing measure would far outweigh all else that they face in this world. They'd feel your loving arms wrapped around them, comforting them. We pray for those with mental and emotional or other struggles, especially in this time of isolation and confusion, in a culture of anxiety. Help us all, but especially those with proclivity towards worry and anxiety. Help keep our minds on you, for you are good. Help us not to be distracted, but to keep our eyes on you, for it matters not how deep the water is when we can walk upon the waves. Hold us tight. May our joy and peace in you be evident to a world in chaos, that they may desire to know why. And may we always be prepared to give an answer to anyone who asks us to give a reason for the hope that we have. Lord, we pray for your will to be done and your kingdom to come. We pray this in the name of your Son and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Let me ask you a question. What does it mean to be human? Nothing like a light question to start off a service. This question is stared in the face of many people philosophers and theologians and scientists for a long, long time. Imagine you're in the marketplace and you're just enjoying your day, taking in all the sights and the sounds and the smells, and you just stop to realize, people, who are these people, these humans? Who are they? Where did they come from? What's their purpose? Do they ever think that? Is there some sort of discernible directedness that we can establish? Or is it something that relativists might just put forth that it's whatever you make life to be and it doesn't really matter in the end? The way I see it is that there's two extremes when it comes to human nature and human beings. One is that we're accidental evolved animals. As the uh, much-worn uh, Richard Dawkins quote, we are just machines for propagating DNA, and that's it. It's metaphysical naturalism as, at its best. Or on the far other extreme is that we are divine ourselves, that we are ourselves God, that we can become goddesses and gods ourselves through meditation, to trying to tune in to the transcendent and, acane, and acquire secret arcane knowledge. But thousands of years ago, the biblical author, author of Genesis pens something so striking against his ancient Near Eastern backdrop and creation myth stories. Men and women are not slaves for the gods. They're not codependent, which means that 
if people believed in the gods, that they would come and bring food and drink, offer sacrifices and festivals, and in return, the god would then provide provision, protection, and so forth. That people are not divine beings. We are like the animals, but not quite. Human beings were made in the image and likeness of God. Now this is perplexing because there are two very important things to take away from this. Both scholars and theologians have wondered this for centuries. We do know that the Imago Dei, or the image of God, which is in Latin, bestowed on human beings is very important. It's very important when it comes to ethical issues and how we handle each other. The second thing is discerning what exactly is the Imago Dei, the image of God. What is the Imago Dei that makes us so important and significant? Our sermon title is, This is Us. This is us, the image of God. So let's do some digging into scripture. What does the Bible actually say about the image and likeness of God? It might be a bit surprising, but it's also very uh, starkly simple. Our text today is Genesis 1, 26 to 28, but really we'll be focused on most, mostly verse 26 and a bit of 27. And as usual, we'll read from the NIV. Then God said, let us make man in our image, in our likeness, and let them rule over the fish of the sea and the birds of the air, over the livestock, over all the earth, and over all the creatures that move along the ground. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. God blessed them and said to them, be fruitful and increase in number. Fill the earth and subdue it. Rule over the fish of the sea and the birds of the air and over every living creature that moves on the ground. Now, first, we are going to tackle the very first sentence of Genesis 1.26. And it's a perplexing one. Um, it says, let us make man in our image, in our likeness, and let them rule. These are plural pronouns. Striking. Well, a lot of people put forth that it's the Trinity. But that's not the case necessarily. Dr. Michael Heiser is an expert in Semitic languages and Hebrew and is an expert in divine council theology. He notes, they might suggest that the plurals refer to the Trinity, but technical research in Hebrew grammar and exegesis has shown that the Trinity is not a coherent explanation. The solution is much more straightforward, one that an ancient Israelite would have readily discerned. What we have is a single person, God, addressing a group, the members of his divine council. Now, here is a rough and ready sketch of the hierarchy, if you will, from earthly beings to heavenly beings. We have the fish, the birds, the livestock, and all the creepy things at the very bottom. And of course, right above that, we can see human beings. And the thin red line that distinguishes the earthly creation from the heavenly creation. Above that is the happy face and the halo representing an angel. And a little bit of a divine council there. And of course, the very beautiful, uh, stunning image there of the elders and the four living creatures with God of the universe at the very center. So as Gary has gone through, Pastor Gary has gone through Revelation, we've certainly discovered all kinds of things that are happening in the unseen realm, uh, which have been kind of put onto our ears that sometimes we forget about as Christians, but they're there. Dr. Heiser gives an example of how to understand this sentence. Single person God is addressing a group. It's like me going into a room of friends and saying, hey, Let's go get some pizza. I'm the one speaking. A group is hearing what I say. Similarly, God comes to the divine council with an exciting announcement. Let's create humankind. God alone creates. 
Then God said, let us make man in our image, in our likeness, and let them rule over the fish of the sea, and so on and so forth. So God, God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him, male and female, he created them. The creation verbs are singular. The members of the council do not participate in the creation of humankind. They watch, just as they did when God laid the foundations of the earth in Job 38. And here is a picture that I've kind of put together of Job 38, 4 to 7. I noticed in the NIV that it says angels, but in the Hebrew it says sons of God that rejoiced at God creating the universe. A really neat image. Copan and Jacobi agree. It appears to be a divine self-deliberation. God alone creates, but in the midst of the he heavenly angelic council or court, instances of such a council are found elsewhere in the Bible. Now, obviously, I don't have time or able to go through all the different views of what the image of God is that have been put forth by different scholars and theologians and so forth. But one thing to contrast where we're moving ahead with is what's called the substantive view or the qualitative view. So the image of God is said to be intelligence, for example, our ability to have our cognitive faculties to think about God, to think about things, and so forth. The image of God being free will, that we have the actions and options to do A or B or do this or that or go this way or go that way. The ability to reason, to think about difficult questions like what does it mean to be a human being? Who are we? And so forth. And, and further down the line, emotions that we're conscious beings. We have a soul or a spirit that we're self-aware, that we're able to speak. We can have language. We can commune with God. For example, we can pray. And also that we're moral agents, that we're able to understand right and wrong, good and bad. But unfortunately, none of these really work when it comes down to labeling the image of God. Of course, now don't get me wrong, I don't want you to not hear what, to hear what I'm saying. I'm not saying that as human beings that we don't share attributes or characteristics with the living God. Of course we do all of these things. But as we'll see, scripture and science both show that it's very ambiguous in terms of these qualities. Scripture isn't clear on defining differences between non-human animals and humans. And secondly, the studies in uh, animal cognition and psychology and behavior are quite interesting. John Walton, who is a professor of Old Testament at Wheaton College, says this, the ability is not the image. The unique human abilities that are often associated with the image of God, as some of them we just went forward with, example, self-awareness, consciousness of God, give us the ability to fulfill our role as the image of God. But these abilities do not themselves define the image. These capacities could feasibly develop as neurological advances over our material development. And here is not a completely extensive, uh, expansive uh, list of Hebrew words, but they're very interesting when it comes to create, made, soul, and the spirit of life. All of them are used interchangeably with humans and animals. That makes it increasingly difficult to figure out what exactly is going on here and how can we distinguish between the two. In fact, one of the biblical writers, the wisdom writer of Ecclesiastes says it nicely and picks up on something, I think. I also thought, as for men, God tests them so that they may see that they are like the animals. Man's fate is like that of the animals. The same fate awaits them both. As one dies, so dies the other. All have the same breath. Man has no advantage over the animal. Everything is meaningless. All go to the same place. All come from dust, and to dust all shall return. Now we turn to the sciences. 
Joshua Morris, in his really fascinating book of uh, science and religion beyond warfare and toward understanding, uh, is really, really good. Um, he is a lecturer of natural sciences and philosophical theology at the University of uh, San Francisco. And he's also a Christian. And he kind of um, sets the stage here. He says, throughout the years, scientists have suggested many characteristics that might serve as the scientifically discernible location of human uniqueness. Traits such as self-awareness, empathy, morality, rationality, sexuality, language ability, use of tools, development of technology, and attainment of culture have all, at one time or another, been put forward as the one special quality that makes humans distinct. Over the past 150 years, however, scientific investigations have not found any of these criteria for human uniqueness to be without exception. And studies showing the similarities between humans and animals have made the essence of human uniqueness increasingly difficult to define. Define, excuse me. A couple of examples. The African gray parrot. The African gray parrot, as we know, obviously, with parrots that we've experienced with or heard of, can mimic language and can speak things and repeat back to us what we've said. But the African gray parrot um, has some really interesting uh, traits to, to its character. Um, when a parrot, an African gray parrot named Alex, had a mirror put in front of him for the first time, he saw the reflection and he suddenly asked his trainer, what color? After the trainer overcame her initial surprise, she told him, Gray, you are a gray parrot. To which Alex the parrot replied, replied, Alex is gray. Alex is gray. Fascinating. It shows a little bit of self-awareness and picking up on human language. And of course, there are many, many others, other examples to go through. We have the chimpanzee picking up the rock to crack the nut to get at its food. The, uh, the dolphin that can look at itself and recognize itself in the mirror. And also there are ravens as well who can grab sticks and make sticks on their own to pick apart ants and also to, to put them through little mazes to find their food. Really fascinating stuff. So how are humans unique then? If they can't be unique in intelligence and creativity and self-awareness and other things, if non-human animals are largely equal to humans, then what makes humans unique? What does it mean to be human? What does it mean to be in the image and likeness of God? We are moving towards an answer. And it could be subtly in the word bara. Speaking of something being giving a divine function by God, not necessarily speaking of the material creation of something, in fact, over 50 times in scripture, bara, the create, means assigning a function, not material manufacturing. That's quite interesting. And here's some examples. God is speaking and he says, I create Jerusalem to be a joy. God isn't speaking that he just created it out of nothing or just kind of put it together. That he's talking about he assigned or wanted Jerusalem to function as a place of joy and thriving. Similarly, David in his anguish in Psalm 51 cries out, create in me a clean heart. Obviously he's not talking about a heart transplant, but he's asking God to give his heart a new attitude and a new purpose. So not creating new material, but giving something a purpose. Which comes to how we can look at the Imago Dei. The image bestowed on humans is a calling, is an election. We are called by God. God calls human beings into a relationship with himself. God calls us to be his stewards and caretakers of creation. And God calls us to be his representatives to the rest of creation. The image and likeness of God, God has elected us. He's chosen us to rule the cosmos with himself. The whole human species as a whole, our calling is a stewardship and a priesthood. Our abilities help us fulfill God's call on our lives. In other words, 
we would do as God would do if he were here. John Walton says it nicely here. It is essential to affirm that all people are in the image of God, regardless of their age, their physical ability or inability, their moral behavior, their ethic and identity, or their gender. The image is not stronger in some than others. It is something that gives us all the dignity of being specially gifted creatures of God. As God's stewards, we are tasked to do his work in the world. We are to be his assistants in the order bringing process that he has begun. Church, God wants to work with humans. He is a covenantal God and he wants to work with you. Going back a thousand years before the time of Christ, when the first temple was being built by Solomon. Israel was to be a light to the nations. It was to image God to the surrounding peoples and nations. In fact, in Solomon's prayer, he declared that Gentiles, that's non-Jews, would be welcome there. However, that temple, centuries later, would be destroyed, and a second temple would be rebuilt. The second temple was a little bit different than Solomon's. Here we have this stone inscription that was discovered a couple hundred years ago, and, it's, and it was right around the Jerusalem temple. Here's what it says. Warning to Gentiles, let no one of any other nation come within the fence and barrier around the holy place. Whoever is caught doing so will, will, will himself be responsible for the fact that his death will ensue. See, the temple was meant to be a house for God, and it was supposed to be a light to the Gentiles. The Gentiles were allowed to come in. Here's where the court of the Gentiles is, but they weren't even allowed to go into the complex. Paul, when he's writing to his churches, he picks up on something very strongly. And he says to them, you are the temple of the living God. Something that even Jews who were believers would have found striking and offensive would have been the Jews who were not for Jesus the Messiah. They would have been deeply offended by this. We're talking about the temple. That's right, that God wants to dwell in you. Paul says in 2 Corinthians 6, 16b, For we are the temple of the living God. As God has said, I will live with them and walk among them, and I will be their God, and they will be my people. God walks among us. God has found a place he has always wanted to be in your life. In Christ, we have purpose, meaning, and value. To be human is to reflect Christ. If we have Christ, we can really reflect who God is. If to be human is to reflect the image of Christ and who he is, and we're called by God, it's a checkup. How are you doing? Now, I realize that it could be one of two things that we deal with as believers. One, it could be sin, and the other are just the grind and cares of life. If we sin, we need to confess that to God or perhaps even to other people. Colossians 3, 8-10 says this, But now you must rid yourselves of all such things as these, Anger, rage, malice, slander, and filthy language from your lips. Do not lie to each other, since you have taken off your old self with its practices and have put on the new self, which is being renewed in the knowledge, in the image of its creator. If it's not sin, if it's things like COVID-19 and the depression that it can bring, mental health issues, just struggling, just down. We want you to know that we're with you. 
if it's sin or the grind of daily life, church, remember, we are called to be stewards and caretakers. We are reflecting the love of Christ to each other. We're ready for action, not just words, not just well-meaningful intended prayers, but we're ready to do works. We are ambassadors for Christ. We're assistants. We're caretakers. Reach out to others and check in on them. Show them love. Be great listeners and be patient. If it's sin that needs confessing, confess it and then do the things you did at first, in other words. Be a Christian. Love the Lord your God with all your being. Love others as yourself. We're all in this together here. We're all God's craftsmanship. For we are God's workmanship, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. And in him, you too are being built together to become a dwelling in which God lives by his spirit. Many people have bucket lists. I suppose I might have one. Perhaps it's some idyllic place that I would like to go and visit before I die, if I only had a day or two or a week to live. A lot of us think of these things and think, what would we like to do? Michael Jones from Inspiring Philosophy Ministries tweeted this out just recently. People have often have grand fantasies about what gratifying things they would do if it was their last day alive. When Jesus knew it was his last day, he washed feet and prayed. He died always putting others first. Wow. Jesus is the image. He showed us how to image and reflect God, and he is our model. He is the servant of the Lord who told us to look out for others, not just ourselves. He said yes to the cross, for he knew the joy of what was to come, and he went to the cross. He and Yahweh are one, just as he said, I and the Father are one. That still gives me goosebumps. He would cancel our debts, break every chain, crush every curse. And keep this in mind, church, if we're struggling, every dark power, dominion, and authority has already been disarmed at the cross. It already has. So if you're struggling, shake it off and walk right through it. This is my king. This is your king. Jesus is the image par excellence. There's none better. He is the image of the invisible God. Remember, Christ is in us. When we come together, we have unity in Christ. We are called to image God. None of us, of course, perfectly represents God in this world. Christ is our standard and we rely and rest upon Christ alone. We are in a process of suffering and character building. It takes time, but we need to fail upwards. We need to learn to walk in his ways. We are increasingly conformed in Christ to his image. So keep your eyes on Jesus, for we are becoming more like him. And keep this in mind. When people see us, they are to see God. What an honor and responsibility. So let's pray together, break bread together, encourage one another. And remember, if Christ is for you, who can be against you? Let the Spirit of God fill you today. And if all else is really hard, remember worship. Adore the King. Put everything aside and rest everything upon Him. Put our worries aside and focus solely on Him and how great He is. If we are the temple, God lives here. I'm pointing to myself here, and you should as well. If God lives here, we can reflect him. If we can reflect him, we are imagers doing what we are called to do.
Jesus died for me. Yes, he died for me. Who the sun sets free, oh, is free indeed. I'm a child of God. Yes, I My Father's house, there's a place for me. I'm a child of God, yes I am. I am chosen, not forsaken. I am who you say I am. You are for God bless you, church, and thank you so much for allowing me this time to share with you what has been on my mind and in my heart. And I pray the richest blessings be upon you, Stanley Park Saints, wherever you're at and whatever you're doing. Let's image the sun. The Lord bless you. The Lord keep you. The Lord watch over you. The Lord bring you peace. Amen. God bless you. You are here, moving in our midst. I worship you. I worship you. You are here, working in this place. I worship you. I worship you. Keep light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. Way make miracle work, promise keep light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. You are here, touching it. I worship you, I worship you, you are here, healing every heart, I worship you, I worship you, you are here, turning lives up. I worship you, 
stop working you never stop you never stop working even when i don't see it you're working even when i don't feel it you're working you never stop you never stop working you never stop you never stop working and even when i don't see it darkness that is who you are 